listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Mental Health Monday, and this is our last episode in this series with Dr. Saunders. But some really helpful insights, I think, that we're going to dig into today. Mm -hmm. Some really practical things uh, about what it means for uh, making a referral or helping someone find or finding a a mental health professional for yourself. So Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the coffee hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, Dr. Stephen Saunders. He's the Schneider Endowed Distinguished Professor of Psychology at Marquette University. Dr. Saunders, welcome back to the Coffee Hour. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. It has been a joy working through your book, Martin Luther on Mental Health, Practical Advice for Christians Today from Concordia Publishing House. And it's just been enlightening. I've learned a lot. Sarah, have you learned much throughout this series? I have. And I always like talking really, about mental health, though. Me too. <laughs> this, is, this is my jam. And and we have more to learn today. Dr. Saunders is a professional clinical psychologist and very pleased to offer ideas and suggestions about mental health and mental health problems on in this series. However, one of his most important pieces of advice is to freq- is to get professional help when you need it. Nothing said in this episode should be taken as therapy or treatment or as a substitute for personal consultation with a professional. So let's dig into more of Martin Luther and mental health with Dr. Saunders. Dr. Saunders, today we've learned a lot. Now it's time to to talk more about application and what it means to find a professional who can help with mental health problems or mental illness. What should I look for when, what are some of the, the key first things, I guess, to look for when identifying a mental health professional for referral for a member of a congregation or a family member or a friend or for myself? What are some of the key things to look for up front? I think that it's a, it's a really important question. A lot of people hesitate. They don't know where to begin. You know, there's a combination of just, just not really understanding what the profession is, what professionals are. We're all used to, you know, everyone went to a pediatrician. If you have kids, you you take your kids to their pediatrician. A lot of us go regularly to a doctor for various long-standing conditions, such as, you know, I see my doctor about my diabetes a couple times a year. If let's say he were to move, it'd be really easy for me to find a different doctor. So, but but there's a lot of unknown, a lot of mystery, so to speak, or or just I I, I just. Just we we don't talk much about mental health, and I, you know, hopefully, one of the things that these past weeks have inspired people to do is to do that. So, you know, hopefully, the book will inspire people to realize that mental health is a, is part of life. Mental health problems are a part of life, and we just start talking about it, but we don't, and so there's this mystery surrounded. Sarah, Andy, what? Just, I'm curious if I if I were to come to you and say, you know, Sarah, Randy, I'm I'm not doing so well emotionally. What should I do? What would you and you want me to? You you've known about this perhaps and would like me to go talk to someone. What would you suggest that I do? I'm just curious. I would probably have a conversation with you first of all and see what what your state in that moment actually is. And if you're open to talking about counseling, I would maybe ask some more questions about like, have you checked resources from your insurance? Do you know anybody that may be a good resource? Have you talked to pastor about it? Those kinds of questions just to kind of feel out what their level of comfort is and if they've even looked into any of the resources that they have. Yeah, my response would probably be similar. That that sounds important. That sounds serious. Tell me more about what you mean. Mm-hmm. It's always good to start like that, which is I'm glad you know, I'm glad you reached out. I'm glad we're talking about this. What have you been thinking? Maybe what you've been going through. Talking to pastors is always a good idea, deaconess. You know, these are these are folks that are sort of closer, a step or two closer to the professions, you know. The, a really important notion, I don't know if we'll come back to this, but calling your insurance company and asking about mental health providers, they, they refer to them as behavioral health 
providers. It's always bothered me a little bit. It's not just behavior, it's thinking as we've been talking about these past few weeks, but whatever. And they'll be able to, you know, you know, almost all insurance companies cover mental health care. Um, so, so what else, what do we look for though? Well, we look for a professional. Mental health professional is a term I use and I use it very explicitly, purposefully, because we want a professional. We want someone who probably went to graduate school, got their master's. Most mental health professionals have a master's degree in social work or counseling, clinical mental health counseling, a master's in marriage and family therapy. Most of them have a master's degree. Some have a, a doctorate, a PhD, or perhaps a PsyD. These are counselors. These are people who will do talk therapy, as it's called, purposefully, you know, legitimately, because mostly what you will do is talk. There are, there are the medical, met, rather mental health professionals who are medical providers, and they're more likely to offer medications. These would be psychiatrists, psychiatric nurses, physicians, assistants, and, and so forth. But I think mostly we're talking about someone to go talk to, and that would be a counselor. And, but you want a professional, someone who has their master's degrees. So a master's comes after the bachelor's. We call bachelor's undergrads. Many of many listeners will have an undergraduate degree, a bachelor of arts or a bachelor of science in, in English or in chemistry or perhaps in business, econ, something like that. Mental health professionals tend to go on to get their advanced degree in a graduate program, a master's program, like, or again, a doctoral program. The difference is the, the number of years of training. So you want someone who is a professional probably someone in your insurance network so that your insurance will pay for it, or at least most of it after the copay and after the, the deductible. And someone who, you know, and this is, this is a little harder to discern, at least at first, but someone who will be respectful, explicitly respectful of your faith and that's not something that can be taken for granted, you know, so does this, you're not likely to find a psychologist or a counselor who is at LCMS, Missouri Synod Lutheran or Wisconsin Lutheran, which is not very common in the field, becoming more common, I think, but still not particularly common. But, you know, you, you do want to probably before seeing the person, ask them about their attitudes towards Christianity, towards religious faith, and you want to hear certain things. What would those things be? What are some red flags if you broach that topic of faith, some things to look for and some things that maybe tell you to look for somebody else? The, so, a great question. So how this will happen, the, you know, so when we, when I call for an appointment with my doctor, I don't talk to my doctor. <laughs> He's too busy. I talk to someone who schedules for him and by the, he sees probably a hundred people a week. It'd be very difficult for him to schedule himself. Something about mental health professionals that is probably universally true is that they schedule their own appointments. What that means is that you will likely call, find a name, call the person. They will call back to try to find a time that will work for the two of you. That's your opportunity to ask the person certain questions. You'll, you'll describe what you're struggling with and, you know, ask them if this is something that they can help with. And at that moment, they'll say probably, or you can bring up, do you have any other questions? Or you can bring up yourself. You can say, I'm a Missouri Synod Lutheran. Do you know what that means? And what does this um, mean? <laughs> yes. And if they gasp, oh, you are, then you might not want to go see them. If they say, I'm not aware of that, what that means, then actually that would actually, in my mind, be sort of a, a positive thing. 
But, you know, and explain what that means. I'm, I'm Christian. I go to church. My family goes to church. Is this something that you'll, you'll be able to appreciate and be respectful of? One of the, one of the things in all of my books that I've pointed out, which is a little bit of a controversy, I, I get in trouble with some friends of mine sort of on a regular basis, but I, I still have this perspective and I do think it's an important perspective. I invite everyone to consider this and reach their own conclusion. A lot of folks out there will advertise themselves as Christian counselors or Christian psychologists. And explicitly what they're doing is they are advertising this about themselves What that means is that they will very, very likely incorporate Christian faith into what they do with a client. Does that sound so bad? Well, what does Christian faith mean to 95, 98% of Christians? Does it mean what the typical Missouri Synod Lutheran thinks about. Do most Christians believe in sin, original sin? Do most Christians believe, you know, and the answer I think is actually no. Many Christians have adopted this modern notion that if it feels right, then it must be right. And that just simply is not what we believe. We believe that guilt, a feeling of feelings of sin are actually legitimate because You know, feeling guilty about sin is a legitimate thing for a Christian to believe. Will the typical Christian counselor, and I put those in quotes, the typical Christian counselor endorse that? Instead, if I go to a Christian counselor and I say, you know, I feel guilty about how angry I am, will they say, well, or how I feel, I feel guilty about these things that I've done that, that are wrong. Ideally, someone would say, well, guilt is appropriate. By the way, go talk to your pastor about this. A good mental health professional respectful of faith will refer back to the director of faith, which is in our case, our pastor, the minister in our church, maybe the deaconess of our church, will refer us back to our church and will talk to us about our mental health. Christian counselors take it upon themselves to evaluate someone's faith and maybe change it if it needs to be changed so that the person doesn't feel so bad about themselves. I'm, uh, yeah, again, I, got, I get into a lot of trouble with, with colleagues for saying stuff like this. They say, no, Christian counselors don't do that. Um, actually, many, many of them do. And, uh, the Association of Christian Counselors actually says this is what we should do. So ask someone. So back to how do you find someone? Well, ask them their attitude towards Christianity, attitude towards Missouri Synod, if they know about it. Ask them what they will do if faith comes up. And what they should do is be respectful of it, ask about it, and if there's questions about faith, refer back to the pastor for, you know, these issues. But again, many will not do that. We're talking with Dr. Stephen Saunders, professor of psychology at Marquette University and author of Martin Luther on Mental Health for our Mental Health Monday. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks for listening to Mental Health Monday on The Coffee Hour. We hope you found this series on Martin Luther on mental health with Dr. Stephen Saunders to be helpful. We hope it has helped you gain a meaningful Lutheran perspective on mental health, mental health problems, and mental illness. We'd like to thank Concordia Publishing House for partnering with us on this series, and they have provided a copy of Dr. Saunders' book to gift to the first listener who can answer this question. What was the word Luther used to describe spiritual distress? What was the word Martin Luther used to describe spiritual distress. If you have the answer, send us an email by Friday, March 15th. The email address is coffee at kfuo.org. 
At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live Uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Mental Health Monday. We are in our last episode with Dr. Saunders today, taking a look at Martin Luther on mental health. Practical advice for Christians today from Concordia Publishing House. We've been learning about how Martin Luther perceived mental health, mental health problems, mental illness, and how he addressed that and responded to that as a pastor, one who cares for souls. And today we're talking about looking for support and a resource in a mental health professional and what that looks like, getting some advice from Dr. Saunders about how to go about finding a mental health professional, what to look for. I'm going to hand it back to Sarah. Sarah had another question before I jump back in. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just thinking about when I have these conversations with my friends and family about seeking out therapy, one of the biggest things that we end up talking about is like, well, what is that first session going to be like? What if I don't like the person? What if I don't get along with them? Then what do I do? So what is your advice, your insight into getting over that roadblock of just entering into the conversation and having the freedom to maybe not stick with the first person you choose? That that's such a great question and great point, which is that you do have to feel comfortable with someone you're going to be spending, you know, an hour a week with for five, six, 15, 20 weeks to talk about things. If and, and you should feel comfortable fairly much right away. So that first session, what will happen is they'll take you into a private room. And there'll be other people in the, in the building and they'll sit you on a couch or or probably in a chair. They'll take another chair and they'll talk about, you know, this is what's going to happen today. Uh, We're going to talk, we're going to get to know each other. They'll explain that everything that you talk about is confidential. That is, they can't tell anyone. You can talk to anyone. I say to my clients, you can talk to anyone. You can tell anyone that you want what you said in here, what I say in here. I cannot. I have to keep everything in confidence. That's a state law. It's it's actually a federal law now. And uh, so everything is confidential. You know, if there's an emergency, if someone's suicidal, then I might have to break confidentiality and get them somewhere safe so that they can stay safe. But there are very few things that, that you know, that there, that's the only instance is if there's a crisis, if there's an emergency where a counselor, a psychologist, a therapist can actually make someone do what they don't want to do. Let me be clear. If someone says, I'm going to commit suicide, a therapist is obligated to stop that from happening to the best of their ability, you know, but the therapist will say, you know, what brings you in? And they'll talk about things and they'll listen very carefully and they'll try to understand. We don't mind read. We, 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 you know, I, I wish I could, except probably I don't wish I could, you know, it's very, it turns out it's very difficult to read someone's mind. Instead, we have to ask, what are you thinking? How are you feeling? What was that like for you? Anything that you don't want to talk about, you don't have to talk about. You know, the, you know, and, 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 and we're very sensitive to that. If someone, if I ask a question and someone looks really uncomfortable, I say, we can come back to that or we don't have to talk about it at all. What you've been through can't make you come back to therapy, can't make you take medications, can't take your kids away, can't do anything like that. It, it literally is a conversation, an in-depth conversation about things that have been bothering you. With a professional, someone who doesn't know you, an objective person who has, you know, who wants you to feel better because of therapy, but has no personal investment in, in you 
feeling better. If I go to a, I don't go to a friend and say, I'm, I'm so down. My friend will say, no, don't be down. Please don't be down. A therapist will say, tell me what you're down about. So that's subjective versus someone, someone that you know personally, but an objective person who will get to know you and will help you think differently about your thoughts and think differently about what you've been doing and and try to understand situations better and help you develop strategies for, for dealing with things. When you're better, they will say, looks like you're better. Congratulations. Hope I was helpful. And goodbye. So I keep teasing my diabetes doctor because I've been seeing him for 15 years and I'm still diabetic. Just, I just don't think he's a very good doctor. In therapy, it's again... You know, it's anywhere from six weeks to probably 16 weeks is how long most therapy goes. And, you know, if it takes longer, it takes longer. So these are things that, again, you know, it would be, be good for, for people to be able to talk more openly about what, what a mental health professions do, what professionals do. You mentioned that the mental health professional is bound to confidentiality. What would it be helpful for me to share with my pastor if I am receiving mental health treatment or, or therapy? Um, what would be helpful to share with my pastor so that he would understand what I'm going through when providing spiritual care for me through that? As much as you're comfortable, say I'm seeing a therapist for depression, for anxiety, for this thing I went through because it's been four years, but I'm still grieving this. And the pastor will very likely say, good for you. How's it going? You know, ask who you're seeing, which fine for you. Again, again, there's nothing that th there is nothing that a, a, a client or a patient in psychotherapy has to keep confidential. The confidentiality is all the obligation of the, of the professional. You can tell your pastor whatever you want. I think he would greatly appreciate knowing it. Hopefully congratulate you for doing it and hopefully say, come in and let's talk about it. And, you know, so that I can, you know, might not say this, but, but from him or, or from your church, you do want that, that necessary spiritual consolation, the reassurance that being depressed is not because you're being punished or because your faith isn't strong enough, all the things that we've been talking about. What are some other fears? I know I, I mentioned one already, but some other fears that people have that keep them from taking that first step and how, how can we overcome those fears of having to go to a therapist and talk about all that stuff that I'm really actually trying hard to <laughs> shove down and not talk about? One of the, you know, I, I think, I think a big fear, which is probably nearly completely unfounded, understandable, but unfounded is that the therapist is judging that, that, that we, you know, somehow we, we go into our field of providing counseling and therapy to persons who are almost by definition depressed and anxious because we want to look down on them. We don't, you know, we, we simply don't. Some might, you know, they're, they're jerks in every field, but, you know, the, the, they'll, they'll reveal themselves fairly quickly that, that they actually don't really care. But, you know, the, you know, I've never, I've never been with, the, I've taught hundreds of, hundreds of clinicians, supervised hundreds of clinicians, taught them skills, um, know hundreds more counselors, and they are caring people. One of the first things that counselors tend to do is to reassure someone, you're depressed, but there's nothing wrong with you. You're depressed. You know, this is, this is something that is bothering you greatly, but it's not something about you. It's something that's afflicting you. And they, we, we, we don't judge. We try to understand, you know, we, you know, one of, one of the things that we take as a given is that anxiety, depression, 
mental health distress in general has a cause. There's something, something causing it. Again, maybe the way the person thinks. Person grows up to think, I'm no good, I'm unlovable. Of course, they're going to be depressed and anxious. But it's actually not true that they're no good. It's not true. The thought, I'm unlovable, is not true. But that would be the cause of the depression. So therapists and counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, we do believe there is a cause and we want to find the cause and help the person get rid of the, the cause being the way they think, get rid of the cause being the fact that they isolate all the time, as Luther did. Luther described himself as isolating and he became very depressed as a result and help them to develop strategies to, to overcome in that regard. The j judgment has no place. We evaluate, we understand, but but we don't judge. We don't look down. It would be a, it would be it would be a, a strange habit for a counselor to have to do that. With just about a minute left, Dr. Saunders, uh, final thought to wrap up our our series together on Martin Luther on mental health. Martin Luther is surprisingly relevant to us today. We, uh, we know that, of course, theologically, that that's not a surprise. But with his, his insights, what he understood from his personal experiences about depression, about anxiety, the, you know, what, what he understood from talking with so many people and the advice that he gave, be aware of your thinking, be aware, be aware of your behavior, you know, go, be social, well, be friendly, go out, you know, be, you know, watch, watch your negative thinking, go to a counselor. You know, he's, he saw so many physicians because he was, you know, he had a lot of physical problems. Go talk to someone about what you're going through. You know, the, you know, the, this is what a good psychologist, a good counselor will say today. So his insights are just, they're just profound, remarkable. They're, they're prescient. You know, he was 500 years ahead of his time. And we can, we can just be, of all the things we're grateful for with Martin Luther, this is yet another. Our guest today, Dr. Stephen Saunders, the Schneider Endowed Distinguished Professor of Psychology at Marquette University and author of Martin Luther on Mental Health, Practical Advice for Christians Today. Dr. Saunders, thank you so much for being our guest on this series and uh, providing some great insights for us. It's been a delight. Thank you both. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.